Right, good morning. I'm told that we need uh, signing this morning because the band was so loud last night that no one can hear anything today. Um, thanks for making it, uh, despite hangovers and late nights. Um, I would say this, but this will be the most important session you're going to hear uh, this year. And I'm going to start the ball rolling. I've got a fantastic panel. Uh, we're talking about Nick Watts, shortly head of NHS Sustainability, and we've got others who you'll meet shortly. You know why you're here. We're focusing on climate, particularly as the state sustainability... Oh, now I'm on. That's good. Um, we're focusing particularly on uh, climate issues today. And I didn't want this to be a, some didactic show where you're just given lots and lots of lectures and facts. So we're going to be light on that. I'm going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes. Nick's going to talk for much the same. That's then going to give us an hour when you can interrogate the panel and they can give us information about what they've done, because I want you to know what it is that you do tomorrow morning that actually makes a difference. Otherwise, you're just going to feel disempowered and miserable. And I'm going to start by making you very miserable, because I'm going to take you through uh, why things are bad. So if I can go to my slides, there we are. We're in real trouble, and you have to be, to be bothered about this. And we're going to talk about decarbonizing, and the question for you is, why should you bother? Oh, I've lost my microphone there. Why, do you, why should people listen now? Because after all, no one has before. You might have done, but most people didn't. And I can show you that by showing you just even the last 20 years. But the message goes back a lot longer than that. We've known for 167 years, John Tyndall's time, that adding greenhouse gases to our atmosphere was cook us. And he warned us about this from burning coal. But we took no notice. We took no notice of Kissinger in the 1970s in the US with their warnings all of the process leading up to the COP negotiations, um, which appeared uh, now in the early 1990s. Even in 95, they said, we have to peak really quickly, and we have to reduce our emissions, but we did nothing. Uh, 13 years ago, they were saying, look, we have to peak before 2020 uh, to have a chance of staying below two degrees, but we didn't. 11 years ago, they were saying, we have to peak by 2015 to avoid dangerous climate change, and we ignored that completely. And eight, now nine years ago, they were saying we had to have peaked within a few years, within a few years, if the world was to have any hope. And we didn't. And that wasn't hyperbole. And it tells you that we have very, very little hope left now. We are in terrible trouble. So during that 20 years of ignoring the warnings, where were we? So this was 2003. And that's what we were burning every single second in terms of fossil fuels. The last data we have, of course, were for last year. So let's have see how things have changed in 19 years. From 167,000 kilograms of coal a second being burned, it's now 258, near enough. 1,000 kilograms of coal a second. It was nearly 112,000 litres of oil a second. It's now 173. And from 83 million litres of natural gas a second, we're now on nearly 140 million litres a second. And if you put the CO2 resulting from that into a very small atmosphere, the concentration goes up. And the atmosphere is really small. If you took the entire global gas around the entire planet and wrapped into a sphere at standard temperature and pressure, it's the size of that pink sphere on the left. And consequently, we put a lot of CO2 in, the concentration goes up. Because it hangs around for a very long time. A fifth of the CO2 we emit today we'll still be boiling our planet in 33,000 years' time, and 7% of what we add today will be boiling us in... 7% will be boiling us in 100,000 years' time. But the last 20 years, rather than reducing, we've carried on going up at an ever-increasing rate. That lets shortwave radiation in, and it traps long-wave radiation, so it's trapping energy at a particular rate. And energy gain at a rate is measured in watts. And you can look at this, what is known as radiative forcing, i.e. the rate of energy gain per square meter of the entire Earth's surface, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can measure it in watts. Uh, 20 years ago, we were just a little over two and a half watts, and we've continued to rise ever since, unsurprisingly, because the concentrations of greenhouse gas have gone up. How much energy is that per second? It's around eight Hiroshima bombs of energy per second we're adding to our atmosphere that's not going anywhere. All right, you say, so what? Nothing bad's happened. And if you really think that, you're either mentally ill or you live on a different planet from me because temperatures are going up. 
20 years ago, that's where we were, and it's been accelerating uh, ever since. And you're going to see it's going to accelerate a lot more. If we look at Arctic sea ice extent, that is collapsing. If we look at Antarctic sea ice, nothing much changed because of something to do with ocean currents we won't bore you with today until about 10 years ago when now things are in free fall. We reached the nadir before, and I've just added the data that came in last week, uh, and we've dropped yet again. If you melt land ice and you expand oceans thermally, the sea levels will go up. So that's where we were at, around two millimeters a year. Then things started accelerating to three millimeters a year. And most recently, we're now at a centimeter every two years. And that gradient is going up very steeply. And it's about to go up more than exponentially. So we're not just going to be sticking at a centimeter every two years. If you add energy to an atmosphere, you get weather. No energy in atmosphere, no weather. The more energy you add, the more extreme weather events you'll get, and the more extreme they'll be. And the Met Office is showing us that the extreme weather events are going up. But you know that and they're going up more steeply. So let's just look at the last two and a half years. This was Australia, uh, Northern Hemisphere winter, just pre-COVID, when just in the east of just one province, of just one country and just one season, that one fire added two and a half percent to global greenhouse gas emissions. But it wasn't the only fire. Siberia was ablaze then, and that fire's continued. Last year, it burned through an area six times that of Belgium, and it's getting bigger because you can't put it out. Indonesia started in its fires, and they have continued. California was ablaze, and now, of course, is every year. The Amazon was ablaze, and is every year, which we'll hear three times more fires in Angola and the Congo. And then we moved into 2021, when Canada caught fire, and has again this year. Greece was ablaze, Turkey was ablaze, Spain, Italy, and then Colorado wasn't just the fires, though. Summer of 2021, top left, the Belgian border with Germany flooding. Top right was Germany. But lower left was the three major floods in August in London, which took out three hospitals, emergency departments, tens of thousands dead in China, and that iconic picture of the New York subway below. Followed later in the year by Australia flooding, by British Columbia flooding, and in the end by nearly 100,000 displaced in the worst ever flood in Malaysia. By 2022 in January, highest temperatures ever recorded in Australia and in South America. Followed by Spain, highest spring temperatures ever recorded. Highest temperatures ever recorded in Pakistan and India. Followed by highest temperatures ever recorded in Europe. Followed by highest temperatures ever recorded in Japan, Korea and China. Followed by highest temperature ever recorded in Great Britain. And things didn't stop there. The flooding then started again. Africa, highest density rainfall ever recorded in southern Africa in KwaZulu-Natal. Same in Valencia in Spain, worst rainfall ever recorded. Followed by Pakistan that had been ablaze, a third of it now underwater. The highest storm surge ever recorded in Florida, Venezuela displacing, and over half a million people displaced later that year in Nigeria. Followed by freezing weather across the whole of North America. This was California in January, completely unheard of. And then into this year, when this was southeast France in February, This was Switzerland in March. This was Venice in March. This was Lake Montebello in France. Then we go through to March here. Highest temperatures again ever recorded in North Korea. Highest spring temperatures ever recorded in Spain. Highest temperature ever recorded in Vietnam. The Panama Canal, this is last week, has now had to lower the drafts of the ships going through because it's running dry, adding $500 surcharge per container driving up your cost of living. Then Canada was ablaze. 5.4 million hectares have already burned this year, and those are the pictures of the smoke hitting New York. Followed in June by Beijing having its highest temperature ever recorded. So this isn't a gradual change. And when people say this is the new normal, it's not. This is a waypoint to catastrophe, and it's going to happen exponentially. And it's catastrophe because no, We can't cope fine. Human ingenuity will not get us out of this with a fix at the back end, because this is what's coming down the line in the next 20 years. We're at 1.12 degrees of global temperature rise pre-industrially. The NASA NOAA data that came out only about six weeks ago show we're now on target for 10 Celsius. 10 Celsius without immediate and grave action. But even before those data came out, the IPCC were warning us 
last year or two years ago that species extinction, widespread disease, unlivable heat, ecosystem collapse, and cities menaced by rising seas will be painfully obvious before a child born today turns 30. So it's not in 30 years, it's in the next 10 to 15 years. That's easily your lifetimes, and if you have children, it's definitely within theirs. We also know on that earlier data, before we knew it was much worse, that in the next 30 to 50 years, 18% of the world's surface area currently occupied by humans will be uninhabitable from static temperature rise. We'll have two thirds of a billion having to move because they'll be underwater. And you haven't even started counting the movement from extreme weather events, crop failure, and so forth. Just on those metrics, that's half the world's population dead or migrating in your lifetimes. Even if we could cope with that, we can't cope with the fact that we will have triggered a mass extinction, quotes, to rival those of the Earth's past. So what we're saying here is by end of century, we would have triggered a Permian level extinction. That's 96% of life on Earth dead. And we've already got eight species an hour becoming extinct. We've already lost 73% of all vertebrates on the planet. The problem is that it's much, much worse than this, because none of that takes account of the fact we've triggered nine positive feedback loops. Fires are releasing carbon dioxide, which makes things hotter again and causes more fires. They release carbon monoxide, which mops up hydroxyl radicals that would normally clear methane, which is 83 times as powerful a greenhouse gas as is CO2. On top of that, we're melting ice and snow that would normally reflect heat and light back into space. That's the albedo effect. When you melt that ice and snow, you expose dark ocean and land that absorbs heat. That's doubled the rate of Earth's energy gain in the last 14 years. On top of that, we're releasing methane from carbon at rock stores, from melting methane hydrates in the Arctic tundra, and from fermenting wetlands. The fires blanket the land and drive up temperatures by insulation. So just the smoke in Australia drove up Australian surface temperatures by another three degrees, making more fires more likely. The black soot that reached the stratosphere is black and it absorbs heat, warming the lower stratosphere, whilst the pollutants destroy the ozone hole. And on top of that, the rainforests are now drying out so much they're catching fire. We're losing 16 soccer pitches to fire every minute now. And the net result of that is that the rainforests, the six major rainforests of the world, are now net emitters of CO2. So even if we stop emitting now, things are going to get more than exponentially worse. And it's worse even than that because weather systems change in binary state changes. You make one change and things move to a new state. And I'm going to take you through a few of those. So the poles, for reasons we needn't discuss today, are warming quicker than the surface average. So the Antarctic is warming three times quicker than the surface average and the Arctic four times quicker. And that can accelerate very suddenly in what are known as dansgaard oeschler events. And there's one there in the middle 38,000 years ago when polar temperatures rose by around 12 degrees in 10 years. This paper from Science suggested that we triggered a DO event that could, could put up temperatures in the poles by 35 to 40 Celsius in the next decade or so. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know what that's going to do to sea levels. Now, you might say, well, Hugh, with a bit of luck, that paper will be wrong. Unfortunately, the jury is now in on this. This was March the 21st last year, when temperatures in the uh, uh, Antarctic were 40 Celsius above normal and the Arctic 30 Celsius above normal. The next day, though, the temperature in Antarctica was 47 Celsius above normal. In the Arctic last summer, the temperature on average is normally 13 degrees. The temperature on average across the whole of the Arctic last year was nearly 33 degrees. And we're seeing sudden warming events. This is the Greenland Ice Dome. The grey is the surface temperature range that we've seen over the last 100 years or so. That red spike was the first weekend in September, September when temperatures rose by 20 Celsius, causing a melt of 20 billion tonnes of water in a weekend. That's 7% of the annual ice melt in a weekend. Bad enough, it wasn't the second year in a row in which that had happened. And we're now decompensating. Um, I'm going to show you a graph now of temperature over a year from December's to January's or January's to December's uh, and each grey line as a year. And what you'll see is those lines have moved steadily up as the planet's warmed. But now look at the black line. That's this year. And that's before the El Nino event kicks in. So this is ocean temperatures between 60 north and 60 south. And we're decompensating because 94% of the Earth's energy gain has gone into oceans. and We haven't even measured it except for these sorts of data. And this will be catastrophic. We now know this is from a paper in Nature three days ago 
that we now cannot avoid the fact that the Arctic is going to be ice-free in the summer. It's gone. All of that ecosystem you've watched with David Attenborough will be gone, and there's nothing we can do to stop it now under any emission scenario. And the really sad part is that it might be gone within six years. Earth's surface temperatures are doing the same thing, same sort of graph as before each wiggly line a previous year. And you can see what's happening at the moment with that steep line at the top. This is going to change Earth's ocean currents um, dramatically. So this is the Antarctic abysmal overturning circulation. Essentially, cold water sinks and is replaced by warm water drawn in, drawn in from warmer climes. And we're predicting, at best, a 42% reduction in that. That is going to be catastrophic for your lives and your children. It will destroy the climate system as we know it. That would be bad enough if it wasn't happening for the southern meridional overturn circulation and the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. This one drawing in warm water from the Pacific, heading up past northern Australia, coming up past us top left as the Gulf Stream. And that's why we don't have icebergs when directly on the same latitude to our left there is Newfoundland, which does have icebergs and snow in the winter. That's the Gulf Stream. If that switches off, it's going to be catastrophic. It's going to, because we now know we're, quote, at a point close to critical transition, when both of those papers saying the same thing, within the next 30 years. The jet stream is warm, well, it's cold, wet air, and it moves very high velocity, driven by the Coriolis effect of the Earth's movement. And it occurs at the junction of cold northerly air and warmer southern air. Because the pole is warming quicker, that jet stream is moving north. That is going to be catastrophic too, because all that rain that comes out of it won't be happening in the south. So it's going to cause a drought in Spain and Portugal. And you heard the president of Spain two weeks ago saying he thought Spain would be uninhabitable potentially within 15 years. Bear in mind, Spain's had to spend 3.8 billion euros this year already on trying to get water into the country, because there isn't any. The same will be happening to Portugal. That rain is going to fall on northern Europe. We're going to get much more intense winter rainfall. But when the AMOC switches off, that's going to fall to snow. We're going to have tens of meters of snow. Meanwhile, in the summer, the jet stream is bifurcating. This is the velocity of the jet stream. It should be one thing. But you'll see there's high velocity on each side with a sandwich in the middle. And that is trapping hot air. And it was that ring of fire that caused the world to incinerate last summer. So we are out of time or certainly running out of time. And the impacts on civilization will be very extreme because drought, for instance, is more than about just crops. This was the Po River, uh, which ran dry last summer. That normally supplies 22% of Italian agriculture. And that, with the heat, collapsed their grain crops, their fruit crops, their milk production, with a cost of over 6 billion euros to the Italian economy last year. And it's already happening again in Italy and Spain and Portugal. Around 20% of uh, Italian power comes from renewables. 55% of that comes from the Po River hydroelectric. So that shut down just when they needed more power for things like air conditioning. There wasn't any. And in France, they rely on nuclear reactors, which need lots of, co of cold water. There wasn't lots of water, and it wasn't cold anymore. So they, like the Chinese, had to trim down their reactor power. So power started failing. Meanwhile, the costs of living were contributed to, that you're now facing, by the fact that the Rhine ran dry. It was down to 36 centimetres at cow, which meant you couldn't get barges through. So every one barge had to download, offload into four barges, putting up the cost of transport in the same way that the Panama Canal is now. And this is going to drive up your cost of living going forwards, and food prices and more. And we've been warned about this for a long time. The Pentagon in 2003 said that if we didn't take immediate action, we risked um, a significant drop in the human carrying capacity of the Earth's environment. That's billions of people dying, and that's exactly what we're now about to start seeing. The IPCC have gone from saying, we've got to stop now um, for safety reasons, to say, two years ago now, any further delay in concerted global action means we miss, risk missing a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. That's when one you, where you, not your children, not your great-grandchildren, you and your children will live. So you go, look, don't worry about this, Hugh. Other people do it. Well, they won't. It is down to you. Why? Because the politicians won't do it. As Pete Brindley said the other day, 
If you've had 27 goes at something and nothing's happened, you know the 28th go isn't going to fix it. This is the uh, y-axis concentration of atmospheric CO2, more or lower in the Keeling data, time on the x-axis, and you'll see the concentration going up despite all of these landmark negotiations marked on the text. There's the last 27 COP negotiations. Well, if you can see an impact on CO2 concentration rise, you've got better eyesight than me because what I see is a gradient that's steadily going up. And remember what they said? We need concerted global action. At the last COP, the target to a peak to emissions was removed. This year, we're not even allowed to talk at the Conference of the Parties about reducing emissions. That's off the table. And the health work stream from which I've withdrawn, their brief was we're not allowed to mention that climate change could harm human health. That's what the Secretary General said about last year. We need to reduce emissions, but this isn't something the COP addressed. So we're going backwards. And bear in mind that Paris said, to be in with the smallest chance, we need to have peaked emissions by 2020. Now we've removed any target at all. We're meant to be on the way down right now. And not only are we meant to be on the way down, the little blue bit at the bottom is we're meant to be drawing carbon out of the atmosphere now. But we're not. Of the 59.6 billion metric tons of CO2 we emitted or were released from land use last year, we drew 1.7 million down. To even get within Paris, which was wrong now, we now know it was still catastrophically it's going to be much, much worse. Even at Paris, you now need to be reducing emissions by 10.2% a year in every single thing you do in your work and life. Every year. And you've only got half a year left. So, the rest of this is going to be about what we do. To give you the language you're going to hear from Nick and Miranda and others, scope one are the emissions that you're responsible for, let's say burning coal in your fireplace, gas in your boiler, petrol in your car. It's the direct emissions. Scope two are emissions from the power that you purchase for lighting, heating, cooling, air conditioning, the MRI machine, whatever else it might be. And scope three is what you're responsible for emissions in terms of what you procure to happen. So getting that patient through that operative pathway. You're responsible for the CO2 emissions of that pathway. Ordering that MRI, you're responsible for that. The syringe that you've ordered to be purchased, the sandwich you buy. So very quickly, you can write this down or you can email me afterwards. If you haven't done this, every single one of you needs to do this tonight when you get in. Move your bank to a bank that doesn't invest in fossil fuel. Right? That's the co-op or triodos. I'm with the co-op. It's no worse than any others. They're not great, but they're no worse than anyone else. But you've got to do this, right? Otherwise, you're bankrolling your children's death. Change what you buy. Just buy less stuff and buy the lowest carbon type stuff. Change your energy supplier. Um, Octopus and Good Energy are probably the two brand leaders. I'm with Good Energy. They're absolutely fantastic. But which say that Octopus have the best customer service? So up to you. But you do need to do that, and you need to do it tonight. And shame on you if you don't. You need to get together with others to act. That's part of what this today is about. But we're told by advertisers that each one of us have seven people that love us or respect us enough to do what we ask them to do. So find that seven and get them to do those other actions. We need to talk about sustenance. You need local, seasonable, vegetable-based foods because they're not flown around the world. They're not refrigerated for a long time. They don't involve cows and sheep belching methane. And uh, I was going to say, and on that issue, we should talk to Sandy. That makes it sound like she belches methane. Sandy has changed the diet that you've eaten. You probably noticed that we had vegetarian food here. You need to change the way you travel. And we need to take political and financial action. The final bit, which Miranda will address a lot more, is that we, the good news is we, in this room, we can change this problem. Because we're only 5.2% of emissions globally. So you say, well, Q... So what, right? We decarbonize our whole healthcare, it makes no difference. The rub is that we're 11.7% of GDP in the world. And if you talk to people like Reckitt Global Health, they make Durex and Dettol, which I think we could probably say are healthcare products. If you start adding in those sorts of things, it's 25% of GDP. If we move that money, everything else changes. And we intersect with every single supply chain. The people who make the cardboard boxes for drug companies in this country make the cardboard boxes for cornflakes. So if we change what we do, and we do it quickly, we can change the whole world. Because that sort of money moving tilts their pension funds and the hedge funds. 
So in your hospitals, we'll come back to this, Miranda will, scope one is relatively easy. Miranda can talk to this a little bit, power purchase agreements is what a PPA is, she can explain to you about reducing scope two. And the scope three, we need to change what we procure. How we buy, we need hospitals to get together. You can't do this on your own. And we need to do less. I don't know about you, but I come to ITU and I look at it and I think pretty much all of these people, it's preventable. We've got clean air, exercise, lack of shitty diets, smoking, alcohol, poverty. Most of what I see would disappear. So, we're facing, we have no time left for that complacency. Remember, it's 10.2% a year, every year, including this year across everything to do. And the positive I want to leave you with, and we're going to move on now to Nick and others, is that we can, we can do this. But if you leave this room today and you haven't taken these actions, you're morally bankrupt. I'm sorry. You, it, you, can't, you could not live with yourself unless you now take action. The positive, though, is if we do, you can be the heroes of the piece, to quote, quote David Bowie. So I'm going to stop at that point. Um, I took 25 minutes, not 20, because we've had a few panel changes. Um, what I'd like to do, I don't know if we have Nick online, do we? So Nick, you may know, is used to direct the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change. Uh, he's now the director of NHS Sustainability, so he's trying to do the big ticket items. And I'm looking at the back there. If Nick isn't online, we'll move, move things around a bit. I'm we are. You can hear me or see me. Nick, we can see you. I'll shut up now and hand over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Nick. Thank you, Hugh. Um, I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Believe me, you guys are going to have more fun. I think, as you've already seen from uh, from Hugh, you're going to have more fun there than I am here somewhere. Uh, believe it or not, in the depths of quite a strange building of, uh, made up of British bureaucracy. Um, I'm going to talk really, really quickly, hey? Normally, I might talk about the why, the what, and the how of why a healthcare system might care about this stuff. But frankly, if you're at this talk and if you've just spent 25 minutes listening to Professor Montgomery, you have a pretty damn good sense of why the NHS might want to run at this issue. And believe me, the NHS is running at that, this issue. So I'll move past that. I'm also going to move past the, the what. The what is you run as fast as you damn can. We set targets for ourselves, 2040 for the emissions that we control directly, 2045 for our full total footprint. They're a little boring because they're so far off into the future. They're a little boring because are they fast enough? No, never. No, never fast enough. Always, always faster. Hugh has made this very clear. The climate crisis is a health crisis. So rather than talk about the why or the what and those big e I'm going to talk about the last 12 months because I think we were actually talking at this conference you um about 12 months ago um the NHS has done an enormous 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 amount in that time over the last 12 months the NHS has shifted primary legislation now right into the beating heart of what it means to be an NHS trust, an integrated care system, any NHS organization in the country. In the Health and Care Act of 2022, we expect everyone, not asking nicely anymore, on the face of the bill, to have their own net zero strategy, to have it be localized, personalized, consulted with patients, consulted with communities, with clinicians, and have a board level lead to start to run at this. Something really cool about the NHS is that that happened 12 months ago, that piece of legislation, three months after, because everyone was ready, because it's a high functioning, damn impressive healthcare system. Every single hospital in the country had its own net zero strategy. So for the how, the first step that we've had to think about is getting our governance in order. I think we're actually doing okay there now. Then you have to think seriously about the big buckets of carbon. So one of the biggest buckets of carbon Hughes already talked about is our buildings, is our hospitals. The NHS owns 65,000 buildings out across the country. It's big. It's often an investor of last resort in communities. Two things there that we have done. Number one, 
a new net zero hospital standard applying to everything the NHS builds, everything the NHS builds over 50 million pounds, drastically raising the standard of what we expect from our buildings, digital first, modular. Let me let me flash up a little bit of humility. There's no such thing as a net zero building at the moment. When you walk through a city and you see these signs up all over the place talking about that, they're lying to you. And so to some extent, I'm sorry, the name of the standard is a little bit of a misnomer. We call it the net zero building standard. It has three phases to it and it has a ratcheting up mechanism. 2027 is the moment that we think we will be able to build the world's first net zero hospital. The technology that we need is not quite, quite there, but it's about 90% of the way there. We've had to invest, we've invested 1.2 billion pounds into decarbonizing our estate. In the last 12 months, we've invested half a billion pounds. That money has paid for itself already. The average return on investment for the average thing you want to do to tackle climate change in the NHS, 3.6 years, this is just such good business sense, good common sense. Now one third of NHS trusts with solar installation pro projects on their roofs, taking up partly some of that funding and partly the power purchase agreements that Hugh was talking about, finding innovative ways to push through, frankly, nonsense bureaucracy. So you have to decarbonize your buildings. You have to decarbonize the way that you move people between buildings. The NHS is the second largest fleet in the country. We own 22,000 vehicles. We induce, we commission another 40,000. And that's before we talk about the patients, the visitors, and staff getting to and from our hospitals and our sites. There are two categories of intervention. Number one, for the cars, for the vans, for God's sake. There is no point purchasing a diesel car anymore. They are old, they are inefficient, the air pollution is terrible, and they cost so much money. We have trusts now up and down the country just as standard purchasing fully electric vehicles because it makes good sense. Manchester Foundation Trust, one vehicle away from having every single vehicle in its entire fleet, and I think they have six, seven, eight hospitals. It's a big trust. Every single vehicle in its entire fleet, fully electric, including 26 and 32 ton HGV trucks moving goods around the city. Four seconds ago, people said you couldn't possibly have that be electric. You have to move the standard vehicles. You also have to move, obviously, your emergency fleet, your rapid response fleet, our double crewed, our double crewed ambulances. About 8,000 vehicles there, but big, weird kind of weird, roving internal combustion engines with all sorts of bells and sirens and whistles on them, and not something Elon Musk is going to help innovate for us. So the NHS had to do a little bit of that itself. A year or two ago, two years ago, we came out with the world's first zero emission ambulance, then the world's second, then the world's third. Then we set those A few months ago, four months ago, we were purchasing more of those zero emission ambulances than Ford and Mercedes were able to, to make for us. We are exceeding their demand already, and so we're having to expand that competition a little bit further. We're now at the point where we have, I think, up in the Northwest, our first ambulance trust turning around and saying, we don't just want some of these. We don't just want more than the other guy. We want to convert our entire fleet, and we think we can do that pretty damn quickly. You have to get your governance right. You have to decarbonize your hospitals, your transport. Your procurement matters an enormous amount. And we've said some big fluffy words. Within the de decade, the NHS will, net, will not purchase from anyone that does not meet or exceed our commitments on net zero. Be weary of people that use big fluffy words like within the decade, especially if it's often a decade. For the NHS, that means one minute past midnight, April 1st, 2027, new qualifying criteria just to enter into any kind of financial arrangement with us. We want to know that we are doing business with companies that are aligned with our values. And if we're not, we're sure your competitor is. But I said I would talk about things in the last 12 months, and I think I've done an okay job so far. A year ago, April 1st, 2022, 
we introduced a 10% weighting into all of our tenders. 10% isn't going to change the world, but what it is going to do is start a conversation between our 8,000, 9,000 procurement offices across the country and our pharmaceutical companies, our medical uh, device companies, everyone that we purchase from. Three months ago, we took the next step. All contracts over five million pounds now expecting to meet that higher criteria. What you can see here is we are slowly, slowly, but really quite quickly raising the bar, running towards that 2027, one minute past midnight deadline. We've had to do that and so, so many other things. We've had to engage in all sorts of different parts of our supply uh, of our supply chain. And Hugh talked about scope three. Scope three, people often think of as though it is just your supply chain, as though it is just the emissions that occur outside of the healthcare system. I don't like that description because I feel like it disempowers us. I feel like it makes us forget that we have agency over over that, that it is our occupational therapists and our physiotherapists who decide what mobility aids patients go home with and whether or not they have a recycling scheme there. It is our asthma nurses and our GPs that decide how they manage their patients' asthma, whether or not they go down the high carbon route, which is often worse for their patients, or whether they go down the lower carbon route. It's our catering staff that decide what food we serve in our trusts. We have agency over all of those different aspects of our carbon. You have to get your governance right. You have to decarbonize your hospitals, your transport, your procurement. The final thing you have to make sure you do, and then I might um, I might stop you and we can move on to the discussion. The final, final thing you always have to do is you have to have fun. This stuff is urgent and it is big and it is scary. Hugh, I'm sure, has convinced you of that. But you have got to have fun when we are running at this problem. Anytime you watch Parliament, anytime you watch a rugby match, in fact, if you watch the Ashes at the moment, it is the team that is having fun that I will put my money on winning. The guys that are high-fiving, that are smiling, we've got to make sure this journey is fun. A little bit of an anecdote attached to that, hey? Last year, we ran a micro-grant scheme. We had 5,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds, not a huge amount of money. But if you were a clinician somewhere in the front line, anywhere across the country, and you had a cool idea, you had something that you thought, God, does the world have to be this way? Couldn't I do something slightly different, slightly better? If you had a cool idea and it improved the health of your patients and it directly tackled climate change and you were going to have a bit of fun and you were going to shout about it, we had 5,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds. When we were planning the scheme, we thought it would be really cool if we got maybe 40, 50 applications through. We knew that the healthcare system was stretched. It's true. The NHS is stretched. It's true. 2022 was a busy year, 2021, 2020. So we thought maybe if we got 40 or 50 applications and then maybe next year we would double that, I think, and we would get up to perhaps 100, and that would be a good functioning micro-grant scheme. We had to close applications early because we had 7,000 applications in the first two days. We had forgotten that when you give clinicians the ability to define the future of healthcare, the ability to define the future of what it means to be a good clinician, a high-functioning healthcare system, they are going to grab that with two hands and run at it. And the projects that people came out with were just so much fun. My favorite, down in the Isle of Wight, uh, we used to, to sometimes get rare, kind of odd, mostly oncology medication down there just in time. We used to send a van, a van, a hovercraft, a van, and then a car out the other side to get the medication there. It was slow. It was inefficient. It was carbon intensive. wasn't really serving their purposes. They've now got drones delivering that medication. Really, really cool. Small carbon saving, big saving for the, pa uh, for the patients and for the trust. But the best part about it is the photograph you see of the first fleet of those drones landing as they're delivering that medication. If you look closely in the background, pressed up against the windows, every window 
of that trust, you can see nurses, you can see pharmacists, you can see patients excited, really excited about the fact that their trust was the first in the country to try this out. This stuff has to be fun. And when we can make sure that we align, yes, the governance, our buildings, our transport, our medicines, our procurement with a bit of fun, that's where I think this stops becoming just something that's nice to do on the side and it starts to become the inevitable future direction of healthcare. I'll stop there, but thank you very much for having me. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there. The ripple for Nick. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. So we're going to canter quickly through a panel. Um, I will make this quick because they're going to give you the headlines of what they think we can all do and how and give you some examples. We've got some superb speakers, but I'd really like you to engage. You're able to send your messages through in app. Um, or you can do it the old-fashioned way and just stand up and shout, as long as it's not abusive. Um, I'll introduce you to Miranda next. So Miranda is not a doctor, but she is a management consultant working with Boston Consulting. And before you all howl about management consultants, she's one of the good people. So she's been working on decarbonizing healthcare. So Miranda, perhaps you'd like to give us a short brief on how we could do it, potentially. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. Hopefully I have some slides. Yes. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to start off by making the point, Hugh mentioned that healthcare drives about 5% uh, of global emissions. And to put that into context, everyone makes a big deal about aviation. This is at least two times um, aviation, if not more. And um, how is that spread across the whole healthcare value chain? You can see that about 50%, a bit more than 50%, is actually in the product supply chain. And another 45 or so percent is driven either through patient care settings, like hospitals, or directly by patients um, traveling to and from care settings. And when we think about what you can really do to drive emissions down, you can see that within the product supply chain, we have to address heat and power along the value chain, and I work a lot with healthcare companies on how they can do that. We need to address the raw materials and agricultural emissions which go into uh, producing all a, a broad range of drugs, and we can get into exactly what kind of drugs um, are creating the most emissions here. And then in pa patient care settings, as Nick mentioned, buildings are driving the majority here. Uh, it's through power, um, heating, and cooling the building, so it's all about switching over to green energy contracts, insulating the buildings. But I also want to point out fleet, also mentioned by Nick, and anaesthetic gases, because a lot of you will be working with anaesthetics, and there are alternatives coming to market now which would reduce that significantly. Um, so I urge you all to think about that in your day-to-day -day practice. So I'm going to talk to you about what can we do on supply chains, and then what we can do for patient care, and then welcome questions and discussion. So on supply chains, there are roughly nine levers to decarbonize. Um, quite a few of those actually are either cost-saving or cost very little. So product and packaging redesign, for example, including a lot more recycled material into packaging uh, for pharma companies, um, reducing material and energy, energy use in the process of manufacturing. There's a lot you can do with solvent recycling, for example, along the value chain. And then switching over to renewable power in manufacturing sites. Very often this is saving pharmaceutical companies money as well as driving enormous emissions reductions all along the value chain. Now the barriers to doing this are generally because a lot of the manufacturing for pharma products actually takes place in parts of Asia where getting onto a green power purchase agreement is more difficult. Um, but I have been working with clients to help them do that at scale in India and China most recently. Um, and even in those markets, you can see quite significant cost savings for manufacturing sites. So there's absolutely no reason we shouldn't be doing the top three levers on this page immediately. Then there's um, kind of switching over to renewable heat. Now, this is a very difficult thing in a lot of manufacturing sites, especially in the upstream supply chain. It can be more expensive. So when you're dealing with temperatures over 500 degrees C, for example, it's not as simple as electrifying that process or using a biomass um, alternative to a fossil-based heat source. You really need to switch over, um, in some cases, to green hydrogen, and I can talk more about how that works. 
And then there are some of the more expensive levers where the tech maturity is lower, um, where those costs will come down over time, it will become easier to do, but what we need to see a lot more of is pharma companies and buyers like the NHS setting really rigorous targets so that those upstream suppliers are forced to invest in those decarbonisation levers. Okay, so that covers supply chains, and I might just mention that analysis that we've done at BCG shows that about 60% of the end-to-end -end supply chain for medical products can be achieved at net zero cost. So 60% of your total net zero product at net zero cost. On the patient care side, uh, there are seven levers to reduce emissions. The first and most important is decarbonizing facilities, exactly like what um, Nick was saying. We need to switch every hospital over to green power purchase agreements. And although they've all got net zero plans, they don't all have green power. So there's a huge role you can play there in just making sure that your, the hospitals that you're working with are uh, switched over to green power. And I might just mention that ICU is the most energy intensive area of the hospital. So every day you're using the most energy, please get your hospital onto a green power purchase agreement. Then there's a lot you can do around improving prevention. Obviously, primary prevention is mostly something that governments deal with, so investing in better health and exercise programs, etc., putting sugar taxes in place. But there's actually quite a lot your colleagues can do in terms of managing disease better. And we've done some analysis in diabetic patients that shows that if, you're, if you put a patient um, that has complications and needs to be on dialysis. The moment you put that patient into regular dialysis for a year, they are emitting three times the average of any individual in the UK. Um, and it's about 100 or more times more in carbon intensive than just giving them an oral anti-diabetic drug. So at the point that they're experiencing complications, that's where you're seeing a massive increase in the emissions. Um, so we need to keep people out of hospital and we need to keep people off the really energy intensive interventions. And then delivering care differently. I mean, you all know about delivering care remotely, delivering it closer to home. It's obvious that this saves emissions. There's lots of studies that we can point you to about how beneficial this is. Um, there's a lot you can do in low carbon uh, treatments. I mentioned anesthetics before. There are alternatives coming on the market. Inhalers is another area which uses very highly emitting propellant gases. There are alternatives also coming available. More people need to be educated about what they can do there. And then I just want to quickly highlight improving efficiency and cutting waste. Um, so here's three examples of unnecessary interventions that we have done analysis around. So the first is obviously reducing over-prescription. And uh, there's a stat here about, we all know about antimicrobial resistance, but um, over-prescription of antibiotics obviously also drives a huge amount of emissions in the product value chain. You can reduce over-investigation. Blood tests um, have been shown to be unnecessary in up to 60% of cases. And then unnecessary follow-ups. Now, it's not really um, as relevant for uh, intensive care, but we've done some analysis together with the NHS that showed that in some settings, up to 40% of outpatient follow-ups are unnecessary. This work was aimed at reducing wait times because obviously you can just get more patients in, uh, in to see uh, consultants, but actually... Um, it also cuts an enormous amount of emissions if you are able to cut those down. I can point you to, there's a lot of publicly available information about that outpatient follow-up um, piece of work. So I think those are things that can obviously be done in, in patient care. I've told you some things about what can be done by pharmaceutical companies. Um, I have a lot more information about what others can do, including regulatory bodies, but maybe we can get to that in the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Miranda. Brilliant. Um, I'm watching the clock because I really want to try and make this interactive. I'm seeming to be not doing very well at that moment. But let me just ask Sandy quickly, since she's on our panel. So you know Sandy, she's our chief exec. Um, you've done an awful lot. So what's your message to the people in, in the room? How did you end up making the changes in terms of the What have you done? Mm -hmm. and, and why was it not? I mean, it was you that did it, but it started elsewhere, didn't it? Can you tell us quickly about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it, it's another language, sustainability. It's really hard to learn that language. So I guess that's my first message to you. Um, people in this room are probably very knowledgeable about it, but there's probably a few people who don't understand the language. Um, and I hope there's a few like me who were a bit overawed by it. You know, I'm a chief exec. My role is to 
um, understand and represent what our members want in the Intensive Care Society. So in 2019, at this venue in our cauldron, one of our trainees presented something, your house is on fire. And Hugh talked with her afterwards. Hugh was one of the dragons of the cauldron at the time, which was really good. And he talked with her afterwards and, and said, you know, you've got an annual general meeting here with the trustees and the council and the chief exec. Why didn't you go and ask them what they're doing? And, and that trainee, Eleanor Dam, came to our annual general meeting and she stood up and said, what's the Intensive Care Society doing about sustainability? What are you doing about your investments? Do you know whether you've got any investments in fossil fuels? And so we took it really seriously. We went back in our first trustee board of the year. That's the governance mechanism, the decision-making mechanism for the, for the society as a charity. And we made the moral decision to divest of fossil fuels. But we also made the decision to look elsewhere. Well, where else can we reduce our carbon footprint? And so we looked at our journal, Journal of the Intensive Care Society. And we were told everyone likes to have it landing on their mat through the door. People like to have it on the coffee table in work. And we said, well, actually, we've got lorries delivering these from here to there. That's all contributing to greenhouse gases. We've got plants printing. Why don't we do it electronically? Why don't we do a digital version? So we made the decision to make JIX digital, which involved as well a governance decision at the trustee board, a financial decision, because it costs us £70,000 a year to produce Journal of the Intensive Care Society. Could we make it cheaper? Well, it did reduce the cost slightly, but not very much. And so the money that we saved from making it digital, we reinvested to do more pages. And we also had to do a lot of contract negotiation with our publishers to be able to change that. So there's a lot of governance around um, sustainability and changing things. When I go back to the investments, Eleanor asked us, are you investing in fossil fuels? And we looked back in our portfolio and we were investing in holiday companies and things and obviously promoting flights, etc. So we went through a procurement process to change our investment providers, our investment management company. But we couldn't do it without the expertise of somebody who knew the questions to ask during that procurement process. And so we asked Eleanor to join our tender panel. Please join us and help us to ask the incisive questions so we get the answers we need so we can make the decision to transfer our portfolio to a green portfolio that's more ethical. So I guess my message to you is, you know, you, you can think global, but act local. There's stuff that you can do locally. Help your chief executive, help your directors. There's an educational element as well, but the subtle education. So we've got lots of education streams that, that we've been doing as part of the Intensive Care Society. We also have a leadership course. So we've embedded sustainability within our leadership course so that the top leaders are also having the conversations, the leaders of the future. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things that you can do and just on a very kind of a micro level, um, but actually has a big impact. One, one little thing that you can do is go away, look online for the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty and sign it and as an individual. Ask your organisation to sign it. Stop issuing more licences to mine fossil fuels. Sandy, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we're going to try and draw, we've probably got two more people that might be able to join us along with Nick on, on the live panel coming in from abroad, um, not abroad, from the rest of the UK. So let's see if we can get them up on screen. And I'm going to actually move it forward to the questions and discussion now, actually, because I'd really like you to be able to, I want you all to feel that you can leave tomorrow morning and know what to do that's going to be impactful. And I'm guessing that some of you are still sitting there thinking, how the hell do I change a power purchase agreement or whatever it might be? So uh, we've got a panel. Um, We've got James, who is um, an absolute expert in saying you've been in this game probably even longer than I have, James, though you're younger. Uh, Nick, you have met. We've got Dominic, who is uh, the director of UCL Partners. Now, you've probably never heard of them, but 24 institutions that care for one in 10 of the adult UK population. So Dominic has been driving the process through with the big trusts to make the big changes. And... We'll put some questions to her in a minute about how it is that you can work 
to make the big changes inside your trust. Dominic, do you, shall I give you the opportunity just to give us a couple of minutes? Would you like that, or should we go straight to questions? Uh, Hugh, I'm happy for you to go straight to questions, if that's easier. I don't, I don't want to give people the t chance to walk away without having asked the burning things, so I'm happy for you to do that. Excellent. So, so Dominic really has made those changes. So she is getting power purchases, going really, really big ticket items, drawing councils together, do contracting. And you may say, well, that's way out of my scope. It really, really isn't. The reason she's doing it is people like me as ITU doctors went and talked with her. So you can do all of these things. So let me go and ask our digital moderator, have we got any questions coming in yet? And if so, would you like to put them to the panel? I'd like to uh, put the panel perhaps to Dominic initially and then the rest of the panel. Um, is what easy wins have the panel instigated in their place of work? So I'll come to you first, Dominic. Dominic. Yeah, great question. So I think it's at a few levels with um, the people that I've been working with. Um, I think there's thinking about what you can do as an individual. We've heard quite a lot about that. And I would urge people to also think carefully about the clinical care that they provide. There are changes that people can make very um, simply and often overlooked. And there was a brilliant paper in the BMJ just recently published by um, Helen Baird, who talks about avoid, reduce, reuse, recycle and dispose. And that's a familiar framework to many working in sustainability. But if you haven't looked at that, it's really worth looking at to say, at an individual level, what are the commitments I can make in my own clinical practice to make some small changes the second thing we've been seeing is how do teams start to do this in collaboration? Um, Hugh and others, Nick, have talked about the importance of doing this together. So at team meetings, um, in, in the different places that you congregate, how are you having uh, different conversations and thinking about the um, collaborations that you need to make around net zero? Uh, what are you doing to talk about that in your mortality and morbidity and audit meetings? How have you created any kind of sustainability groups that, that work in your specialty? What research is coming out that you can present at journal clubs, et cetera? And we're seeing people do that kind of stuff to really start changing conversations and culture. But the place that I have spent most of my time working and Hugh has alluded to is really at the level of organisational management and leadership. That might be your board, your executive, executive team, or your divisional management structure. And that really, I think, takes a bit of courage and advocacy to think about um, getting involved and influencing. And, and one of the things to do is have a look at your own organisation's plan around um, sustainability and, and speak to people who are involved in uh, some of the writing and implementation of that. We need to get better as um, those who work in the clinical services, linking up more with those who manage, um, those who make financial decisions and those who... Um, have a holistic leadership role and, and we've been starting to talk about better care, better cost um, and lower carbon. So thinking about how um, clinicians can get involved in those conversations, speaking to your medical directors, your divisional directors, um, turning up at public board meetings and starting to ask difficult questions about where has um, sustainability, where has carbon been factored into these decisions. So there's lots of places people can act. They can think about their sphere of influence and control being quite immediate around their own practice, around the teams that they work with, around the research that they might get involved in, the improvement projects, and then really some of that bigger picture influencing and advocacy. And it's about finding those connecting points and, and going and really having those courageous conversations. I'll, I'll just jump in there quickly and then uh, be good to hear from James as well. Um, this sounds way beyond your remit, but it really isn't. Get together with the gang, find out who in ED or your anaesthetic department or Robson Guiney is interested, and then map it out. Go and see your head of estates, go and see your head of procurement, go and see the person who's responsible for power, go and find who your non-executive directors are, open a conversation with them, say, when are these contracts for food going to change? When are these contracts going to change? And then help bring them solutions. Say, would you like me to go away and find out how that can be done and bring it back to you? And they'll almost certainly say, well, that'd be really great, thank you. And there are people like Dominic who know how to do this. There are people like James who know how to do it. I know a little bit about how to do it. There's the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare in Cambridge. You can look that up. You can contact them and say, how do we do this? And bringing people solutions, not problems, is a really big way of making changes. So you might look at it and think, all I can do is recycle. No, you can change the contracting for power for your hospital just by helping the people at the top board. But, but James, you've done a lot of this as well. Um, any thoughts on tomorrow morning, what they can do at work.
Um, sorry, it's a little bit laggy at my end, so sorry if I've talked over you there at the end. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd echo what you've covered already, Hugh. So um, I'm not a clinician, I have to declare, no clinical um, qualification whatsoever, but I'm a child environmentalist and been working for 20 years in this work. So um, I really, the three I had prepared, Hugh, have kind of already gone over. So find out who your sustainability lead is in your organisation or the sustainability team. They will do the donkey work for you. And often, in my own experience, clinician leaders tend to open doors that we can't so we'll have the tools and the means of bringing people together like estates and procurement and medical equipment people but often that just takes that little bit of interest for an eleanor or a hugh to really open doors and i've got my own i've got my own eleanor and hughes in my organization that i've really linked up well with and that's where we've been able to to make good change and then dominique already covered on acting within your sphere of control and influence at all Frozen. Talk about that a lot. You know, this is huge, and I can do within your own personal life and your working life, but also where you have touch points elsewhere. So I would absolutely echo what Dominique said, and then talk about it. And I loved what Nick was saying about have fun there, but also talk about where it's been hard. You know, like it's really difficult to you know get vegan food in places, or oh my god, it's paying down. It was hard to buy into work today. It, it helps humanize and normalize the work and the changes that we have to do. But then people look up to that. So whether that's on Twitter or other platforms, because we've got to make this normal and then you know more people you never know the ripple effects that we're going to have on extending that beyond uh, there's loads of networks out there and um, there's loads of special interest groups i know ics have got it and elno's done excellent work there um, and there's other specialities so you will have green doctors green nurses within your big organizations and um, just find out who they are find your tribe and work with them wonderful thank you and James has done really extraordinary work at Newcastle. Again, none of the people that you're seeing here object to you sending them an email saying, how do I do this? And if they don't know, they'll tell you who it is that you should go and speak to. Uh, what other questions do we have? Well, our top raising question is, could you make the recording of this session downloadable, accessible to share with our local teams, friends and families? And why is Hugh's presentation not being delivered to the world? So I would like to ask, can we do that? But also, what is the best way of getting our message across? Does anybody want to well, come in on that? Well, the first question, can we make this available? Yeah, yes. so okay. um, this Good. is endured content for six months for everyone who came here. Um, but for this particular session, there's no reason why we can't just put this on our YouTube channel and make it freely available. So I'll, I'll speak to colleagues and see how quickly we can do that. You heard it here first. <laughs> Thank you, and thank and you for, for thank asking you to the question. whoever asked the question, because that is the first step. You can get this into your grand rounds. You know, you, you can get it into the meetings, and you can get it into your conferences, because Sandy has. That's why we've got a session today. So is there a good way of getting that, that message across? Um, go on, Miranda, you go first. Do, you, do we mean by that the message of catastrophic climate change? And what to um, do. And, and what do we do about it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that the message about catastrophic climate change is being delivered and probably most people in the room were aware of it, um, although not as powerfully as Hugh delivered that. And I think it's obviously that everyone in this room just needs to um, deliver that more strongly to everyone they know. Mm. What can they do about it? Um, mm. I think we are trying to make it clearer um, the, the steps that everyone needs to take. Again, it's a question of everyone in this room informing um, everyone they know. I do think big educational programs for school children and actually more uh, medical students having sustainability taught in medical schools would be very helpful. I know Hugh, you, you've been working mm. on that as well. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I think I, I would echo, I mean, the big thing, remember that number from advertisers. At least, it's a minimum of seven people will do exactly what you tell them, no matter how stupid, because they love you so much or because they respect you so much. They either love you so much and say, well, I think this is crap, but you know, I do love them, she is my daughter, I'll do it. <laughs> or because they say, well, this person seems to know what they're talking about. That R number, look what happened with COVID with an R of 3.7 when it started. With an R of seven, you could start a brush fire today that could be absolutely extraordinary. F make a note of those seven people and go after them and get them to move their bank accounts and the everything and everything else we've talked about today. That, that I think is, probably the biggest thing. Sandy, what would you say? Well, the A biggest thing yeah. to... Actions. Uh, the biggest action. 
Um, I think talking with people, exchanging information. I think um, on a personal level, for me, I'd, I would actually write to my MP yeah. and say, can you support the notion that we do not issue any more licenses, any more new licenses for mining and for drilling for oil? Um, I'm not somebody that goes and stands on the road and stops events, but I think there is power in speaking to your MP. Mm. Make yourself known to your MP, particularly as we're coming up to election time. Yeah. They'll be really keen to hear what your mm. views are. It's a really good point. I should say that messaging is really important. So um, when you move your bank, if you haven't already and you move tonight, two things you do. You contact the bank you moved to to say, this is why I've moved. And you contact your old bank to say why you left. Mm. And without giving secrets away, there is one of the big five high street banks that wants to move to zero investment in fossil fuels. It's a really big high street name bank, one of the really big five. And they want to move. But the board CEO can't do it unless the board of directors can see that that's where the market's going. Unfortunately, I can't tell you which of the big five it is. But if you write to your, the CEO, just send an email and say, I have left your bank because you're investing in fossil fuel. It's all over. And I'm telling all my friends and family to do the same. That sort of thing makes a difference. And in an election cycle, it makes a really big difference mm. coming up now. But let's not disenfranchise Dominic, James, and Nick. Um, quick action points for tomorrow morning. Personal actions. I think we're all waiting for each other to go, so I might just jump in. Um, I love that question, Hugh. It's the 9 a.m. tomorrow morning question. It's kind of the only question that matters in sustainability. Um, my answer is a little naff. I don't really care. The only action that I think we should focus on is the action you're actually going to go and do. In sustainability, we often spend too much time thinking through what is the perfect thing, what is the biggest thing, what is the single most important thing. And frankly, there are thousands of things. I think the thing you should do is the thing you're going to do tomorrow morning. It doesn't have to be the biggest thing in the world. It can be really, really simple. You can turn your lights off. Don't care. You can change your lights to LEDs, whatever you want. But go and actually do it and then do another thing the morning after that and then another thing the morning after that again and again. Intellectualizing this through to 2050, you know what the outcome of that will be. I think, I think the thing that matters the most is that people take a step today. So, um, who should we go next? Dominic. Dominic next. Um, Nick, we're playing bingo here because I think I was just about to say that. So, at the at the risk of sounding like I'm being repetitive, I think it is exactly that. Pick one thing to do, commit to it, and then be consistent over time with that thing, and keep committing to more things because um, we know that we do need big big bang stuff to make a change and the stuff we do around the big decisions with boards will be really important but the commitment to go and have a conversation change a piece of behavior do something different in your clinical practice or personal life and influence someone else will be the ripple effect that we've talked about so please everyone in this room uh, go and do something differently tomorrow and really commit to that and james 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 your turn within your organizations to find out who that person is um, and work with them, offer your help. Don't, don't underestimate the power of the clinician voice. And this is as a non-clinician. So you're the most trusted voice in society. So you can lend your social capital to this work and it will, it will lead to huge change. Don't underestimate that. Thank you. We have four minutes left. So uh, four minutes in the remaining four minutes. Ethical questions are coming through, so I'd like to put that to, to you, Hugh. Um, when does it become appropriate to discuss rationing access to intensive therapies um, in the context of ICU? So that's a difficult one. It's part of it's difficult, part of it's not. Um, we could open a whole can of worms here. We, we overtreat. We put people on ITU who shouldn't be there, and they weren't there 20 years ago. We never will put demented 92-year-old people with metastatic cancer, heart failure, and sepsis on an intensive care because the family told us they wanted everything. That would never happen. And we used to be able to navigate that. We used to sit down and say, I'm so sorry that your mum is dying. Let's make her comfortable somewhere. Would you like that to be at home or here? And I still do that. 
But I appreciate that the generation coming through find that increasingly difficult. But we do need to start having those conversations. You know, 25% of our ITU patients die. A lot of them don't have a high quality of life afterwards. A lot of them are nearing the end of their life anyway. So I do think it's not about rationing so much as saying, what's the right thing? And it is difficult when everyone's on a shift, isn't it? It is difficult at the consultant level or the junior level, but I do think we definitely need to be doing that because the carbon footprint, let alone the three grand a day we spend on those people um, for an undignified death. And the phrase I often use with patients and relatives is, I can prolong your death, but I can't save your life. And we need to start thinking about that a little bit more. But I don't think we're yet at the point of rationing. I think we will get there, but I don't think we're there now. I just think we need to be a bit more compassionate. Okay, and one more final question. Is a comment, really. I am so impressed that all of this is going on in the NHS healthcare system. Shout about it. It is the antidote to apathy. So I'd like to ask all of the panel if you can just quickly tell us, what is your antidote to apathy? Start with... All right, it's one line each. Why don't we start? Uh, choose someone. Go on, James first. James. Oh, God. Well, I, I'm, I struggle with this all the time as someone who knows it and is working it as an environmentalist. So it, I tend to get my energy from clinicians who get this. So I'm in an 18,000 staff organization. So I go where the energy is to keep me sane. So I, I feel everyone else could do the same. Reach out to your tree hugger, but also reach out to your other green clinicians. Wonderful. And uh, Dominic? Mine really is about connecting with people. And you'll find the more conversations you have on things like this, the more you have commonality. And I think these types of problems need to be tackled with uh, collaboration. So I, my, the antidote to apathy for me is real connections. I'm a massive extrovert, so I love to talk to people and um, make connections with people about what they're doing and hopefully learn through that process. So connect and learn is my antidote to apathy. Nick? The big, big, scary, scary, scary problem. Um, possibly too big, certainly too big for any one individual to take on. Kind of terrifying when you really think about the full scale of the whole thing. And are we ever, ever moving fast enough? No, never. Compared to where we need to be, never. Are we one hell of a lot better than where we were just half a heartbeat ago? Yeah. I, I think, to be honest, the only thing that makes me feel better about the scale of the problem is feeling as though I'm doing something about it feeling as though I can look at the progress that's being made and the things that wouldn't have otherwise happened. Thank you. Nick. Is it enough? Never. But does it make me feel a heck of a lot better? And is it better than where we were yesterday? Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Miranda. Um, I think probably just seeing that actually the activist voice is becoming stronger. So I've been at a few cops where the outcomes were super disappointing, but there was mm -hmm. an increasingly large group of activists agitating, people are increasingly informed about what to do. And actually, I'm working with a group of pharma companies at the moment who all just decided to set a net zero target across their operations and entire supply chain by 2045, which is five years earlier than what's required for a 1.5 degree pathway. So there are some companies also stepping up and doing stuff. I mean, also, sorry, one more thing. The Inflation Reduction Act in the US is going to yeah. be one of the biggest, most significant pieces of legislation that has been passed for climate ever. Um, the carbon border tax adjustment mechanism that's going to come into place for the EU will have an enormous impact on supply chains globally mm. for climate. So there are some bits of uh, legislation moving in the right direction. It's about keeping the pressure on companies right. and governments. Thank you. Sandy? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I get stuck into inertia when people talk the complicated language of sustainability and the scope one, two, three in China, where, oh God, have I done this? Uh, and I think just do something. And Nick's mm. comment before, just do something, however small, that keeps you motivated and don't mm. get hung up with the language. Right. Um, so I'm going to draw this to a close. I'm going to mention one other thing that, I mean, we're all members of lots of societies, right? So there are lots of societies who want to do stuff. They're all members of something, UK Hack, which is a the Royal Colleges together. So write to the Association of Anesthetists, the Royal College of Anesthetists, the Royal College of Physicians, mm -hmm. whoever else, and say, look, the ICS has done it. I'm expecting you to, so that's something for tomorrow. One last thing to say, um, and I don't want to be completely inundated, so think very carefully before you send me an email, but we've got some money to employ some staff, uh, full or part-time, but we want people who are really committed, are going to drive, that really want to make the change. You don't have to be an expert in scope three or PPAs or law. Mm -hmm. We just need people who are seriously committed. 
and I might be able to buy your time uh, to join and come and work with us. So um, think about it very carefully before you send me that email, because I don't want thousands of them coming in from people who aren't committed. But if you are interested and I can support you, uh, please do. So thank you very much all for being here. Thank you to our absolutely fantastic panel. We'll give them a little ripple. <laughs> And thanks again to the ICS and the leadership, Sandy Schoen, because it has been absolutely extraordinary. Thank you, Sandy.